Bona tarda, estem en directe des de l'estreaming de la mostra de films de dones, juntament amb el CCSB en aquesta sessió dels manifestos fílmics feministes. És un programa que fa sis anys que realitzem amb aquest Centre de Cultura Contemporània de Barcelona i aquí des d'aquí ja agraeixo aquesta complicitat de llarg recorregut i aquest any, excepcionalment, ja ens veieu, no ens podem trobar a les sales, ens hem de trobar a través d'aquestes pantalles i us agraeixo aquí, us hagueu pogut connectar a aquestes hores per seguir aquesta conversa tan interessant. També he d'agrair, per suposat, a Filmin, que és l'altre company de viatge excepcional en aquest any tan estrany, perquè són la plataforma en la qual hem confiat mútuament per poder fer assequibles les pel·lícules que formaran part d'aquest cicle i de fet les podeu veure, si no ho heu fet encara, fins al 13 de desembre a la seva plataforma. Deixeu-me que comenci estirant una mica el moment dels agraïments. Vull agrair també molt profundament a tot l'equip de Drac Màgic que fa possible la mostra de films de dones. Ha estat un any molt convuls i ha sigut especialment complicat. Ha estat un repte bonic de viure conjuntament i des d'aquí els vull agrair tota la seva feina. I per suposat, moltes gràcies a aquestes convidades de luxe. Thank you very much for being here today. Crec que podrem gaudir d'una conversa molt rica i també podrem aprofitar per conèixer una miqueta més aquests projectes tan pioners i tan excepcionals, a més que venen d'arreu del món. Res més, us comencem a explicar una miqueta el funcionament de la sessió perquè no hem volgut deixar de banda la interactivitat dels públics. Per tant, aquí al meu costat està la companya Maria Zafra. Ella, com veieu, té l'ordinador i està connectada a l'altra banda perquè li pugueu fer preguntes. Sí, qualsevol comentari o pregunta que vulgueu transmetre a les invitades, la podeu escriure a la web de la mostra de films de dones, on heu trobat el link per a aquesta conversa online. A la part de baix de la pàgina web veureu deixar un comentari i ahí només heu de de clicar i ho rebrem i jo transmetré a les invitades. Una altra informació tècnica abans de passar de canviar l'anglès, de fet, i de presentar a les nostres convidades és precisament la informació sobre la llengua, de l'idioma d'aquesta xerrada. Farem la sessió sense traducció, serà una xerrada en anglès. El que sí que podreu accedir després, posteriorment, enregistrarem la xerrada i la subtitularem. Per tant, a la mostra de films de dones, al seu arxiu online, podreu trobar més endavant aquesta conversa traduïda per qui vulgui reveure-la. I think now it's the moment that I have to switch to English. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for being here with us today. Um, yeah, I'm very glad that we managed to organize this conversation. And I have to say that all your projects have been very inspiring for us uh, along the years. So for me, it's like a, a, a huge pleasure to have you, have you all here. Um, this conversation is part of a, a film program which is dedicated to films directed by women, of course, but uh, and made uh, collectively, uh, collectively in a board and uh, I would say non um, monolithic understanding of the of the of the world and and um, and those films that we selected are mainly produced during the 70s and 80s, which was a very prolific moment for those uh, those kind of uh, film collectives and spe especially for the, the feminist film collectives, I would say. I also want to say that it's a, a program that is part of a bigger um, curatorial investigation, we could say, uh, with which we, we want to contribute somehow to the recognition of collective practices. Uh, in films in, in film history and especially in uh, feminist film history 
uh, in a way also to recognize the, uh, the other uh, histories of cinema and, um, and the non-hegemonic uh, histories of cinema. Um, most of the films selected in this uh, program are available uh, thanks to the work that uh, organizations like yours are doing. So thank you again in this, in this, in this sense. Um, it's a work that it's preserving not only physical copies, but also the social histories that these films uh, represent. Uh, and for us, it's very, interest it's very interesting and very important also to under underlie uh, those, those his uh, social histories. Um, I want to take also this opportunity to thank uh, Frances Reed from Iris Films and Terry Rock from uh, Leeds Animation Workshop, also to um, Chrissy Stansfield from the Sheffield Film Co-op and all the women behind the Sheffield uh, Feminist Archive for their help and their support and their information. They have been very generous with, with us in this, in this investigation. Okay, so... I will shut up in a, in a few, in, in one minute. Um, you all represent, as I was saying, projects and organizations uh, with a long life, and you have been promoting uh, women's cinema and feminist uh, film history for, for many years from different fields, uh, from uh, exhibition to distribution, also production sometimes, um, film critics, and um, I would like you to share, if you wish, your stories with us today, and also uh, we can discuss how the role of those um, collective, the role that collective practices have played somehow in, in, your, in your initiatives, if you think that that's uh, worth uh, explaining. So, um, I will start uh, doing the presentations. We have with us Emma Hedic. Thank you, Emma, for being here uh, today. She, uh, she's a member of the Sinanova Working Group. The current members are Tracy Francis, Charlotte Proctor, uh, Irene Ravel, which uh, I, I want to pronounce as a Catalan name, but I'm, I'm not sure that she's Catalan. Sorry for that. <laughs> um, uh, Luis Shelley, Moira Salt, and Marina Vichmit. Uh, the Sinanova Working Group started in 2010 and oversees the ongoing work of preservation and distribution as well as special projects that uh, seek to question the working conditions of Sinanova as an organization. And for those who don't know Sinanova, uh, it was founded in 1991 following the merge of two feminist film and video distributors, um, very famous too, called uh, Circles and Women of Cinema, formed in 1971. Uh, thank you, Emma, as I was saying, thanks for being here. We also have Nicole Fernandez Ferrer, also a name that uh, is pronounced in Catalan <laughs> somehow. Um, she is the general director of the Centre, Centre Audiovisual Simone de Beauvoir. Uh, Le Centre Audiovisual Simone de Beauvoir is, a, is in Paris and was founded in 1982 by Carol Rosopoulos, Delphine Seyric and Joana uh, Vider. These three feminist activists, they were all involved in the practice of video and they placed at the center of their objectives with this center, the conservation and creation uh, of audio audiovisual documents that would uh, record the history of women, their rights and their creations. This center was closed mainly due to economic reasons uh, 10 years after they began running, but in 2003 they started a new life uh, under the impetus of a new team and with broader objectives. I think that Nicole will tell, uh, can tell us a little bit more about that uh, later on. Thanks, Nicole, for being here. We also have with us Carola Graman, who is a film curator. She co-founded the Kinotec Asta Nielsen in Frankfurt am Main in uh, 1999 and has engaged in feminist film and cinema work since then. Her special passions are experimental film, silent film performed with live music and queer cinema past and present. She has collaborated with Heidi Sh uh, Sh Shulupman uh, and other, uh, on text, film programs, and retrospectives 
on films, uh, on, on the works of Germaine Dulac, for instance, Asta Nielsen, uh, uh, Nielsen, Elvira Notari, and Jack Smith. And together with uh, Gabi Babich and Heidi Schlumpen, Carola founded Remake. Remake is the uh, Frankfurt, Women, Frankfurt Women's Day Films, uh, and it was funded in 2018, quite recently. I think that we can hear something more about that project um, later. Thanks, Carola, for being here. Thank you very much. And um, you. we also have here Debra Zimmerman, she is uh, connecting from New York. She has been the executive uh, director of Women Make Movies since 1983. This uh, nonprofit organization is based in New York and is dedicated uh, to promoting and disseminating the work of uh, women filmmakers. Is one of the most important distributors of audiovisual content and women's film in the world, if not the largest collection, I would say. Um, um, and they also organize programs to support film production uh, for women. And this year, in times of global crisis, they organized an online film festival. Quite big one. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie, for being here with us. Um, so presentations are done. I would say that uh, we start. We want to hear your, your stories. Emma, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Marta, um, and thanks to everyone, Carla, Nicole, Deborah, for all of your um, work and inspiration over the years. Um, I really appreciate being here with you. Um, my name is Emma Hedich, um, and I use uh, they, them uh, pronouns. Um, I just want to um, start with just kind of um, taking the title, or which I read um, the title of this program as a kind of feminist uh, film manifestos, as in the, the term manifestos as a way to think about writing that has occurred um, through Cine Nova. So I sort of took this angle um, to think about all of the ways that we use writing uh, as uh, contracts, presentations, emails, writing articles, um, all the legal documents that we have to produce or want to produce um, in our organization. Um, so I'm going to read uh, an extract from an online text that I wrote in 2005 from, uh, for the Lux Online project in a, um, as a kind of memorial of a memorial to the filmmaker Sandra Lahir. Um, and then I'll read uh, the working document, which um, the Cine Nova Working Group, which I'm part of, um, has written and is um, outlining our values and our working methods. Um, so I'm sharing these documents because I think um, I think of them as these short manifestations of the working and thinking that we have done as a group and organization over the years and a gathering of friends. Um, and I think that writing documents um, or this process of writing documents brings forth a kind of accountability process in which we try to articulate our different values and then how we try to put those into practice. Um, and so I think that is perhaps useful for people who are thinking um, about you know, forming groups together um, as a as a, as a kind, of, kind of practice. So um, in this way, these texts don't represent the work that we do, um, they are it. So I want to sort of think through that, um, you know, centering the writing and the kind of uh, process of writing that we use, um, as well as all of the other work that, that we do within the distribution. Um, so I would encourage any of you who are here um, listening to and or thinking of forming collaborations or um, working with groups to consider writing statements, manifestos, handbooks, or 
all these kind of thoughts and reflections together as a way to understand that kind of community accountability or um, or the group or how the organization is is kind of planning to uh, practice. So this is the first text. Um, so this is from 2005 and it's called Circles so Social, which refers to the organization circles that um, is one of the founding organizations that Sininova um, came out of. It was an old church, which was odd because it was so cold and people had to keep their coats on, which always makes things feel a little bit uncomfortable. There were many women there, all part of different institutions and then artists, um, it felt important to come and what followed made it feel even more so. People were invited to come and talk in front, in the front about what they knew of Sandra Lahir. It was a bit like a Quaker meeting, people just standing up to say small things that became vast and filled the space. Others had more prepared speeches. Liz Rhodes read letters from Sandra to her. It was moving. She only described the intimate details of the world around her, her pain, how she struggled for her work to be recognized by funding bodies, how women are marginalized, her longing for a collective social spirit and humanity, her sexual desire all with incredible humor and dignity and intelligence and charm. In the room, her friends, those people that had supported her and that loved her uh, so much and worked with her. Other filmmakers described things that they had done together. One woman said how when they were at the London Filmmakers Co-op in the 80s, there was a backyard in the back of the building. One day she was there eating blackberries from the bushes and Sandra appeared and said, nothing, nothing but blackberries and proceeded to munch on them together all covered in purple juices. <laughs> I composed something in my head. I would nail down and describe a scene that I experienced before. Wanting to have the time to talk and showing my commitment in my mind, I said, we are in trouble and we need uh, to deal with this whilst you have been working and spending money, all the things you have been assuming about our art, we have been putting our bodies at risk. And this is a testament to that. I was absolutely sure. After I spoke to some of the women there and I tried to avoid others, we watched all of Sandra's films. There is one called Serpent River made in Ontario. She made three films there. They're, they're about a uranium mine and its impact on the environment and the community. So this is the second document. This is the Cine Nova Aims and Objectives and this is an ongoing working document. Uh, number one, the structure and membership. Since 2001, Cininova has been run by volunteers dedicated to the constellation of films, histories, and politics that make up the collection, believing in the necess necessity of keeping it autonomous and in active distribution rather than dispersed into larger and more general archives. This group of volunteers called, is called the Cininova Working Group. The current volunteers are Tracy Francis, Charlotte Proctor, Irene Revel, Moira Salt, Louise Shelley, and Marina Vishmit. Although we do not strictly have a membership-led base, the choices concerning how we work with the collection is informed and aided by the conversations we have with film and video makers, grassroots organizations, researchers and other educational or specialist groups who are both invited and request to view and work with Sininova. The Sininova Working Group acts as the organizing committee asking how this group can operate collectively and voluntarily to ensure the ongoing care of the collection and its public access 
as an underfunded organization, how it can stand against the replication of exploitative work models. Number two, research. In many ways, the necessary day-to-day -day labor of administration is simultaneously an ongoing research practice with the collection and with the filmmakers. Some of the works we distribute are not in good material condition, and some of the work is the only surviving copy of a work. Rather than hiding these material conditions, we encourage a shared conversation about the various forms of precarity we encounter, the materials and the history of the collection, both figures and resists, and it is this which defines the efforts of the working group and its collaborators in many different ways. The distribution work is carried out from London where we share an office at uh, the Lux and online from our homes, which are in uh, a few different locations. Many of the film prints are stored at the British Film Institute. Uh, we operate with four committees in our, in our working group and each uh, member of the committee tries to commit to two of these for a two year period. These committees are distribution and collection, finance, design, engagement and planning. Distribution handles all of the uh, work responding to requests, checking materials and liaising with filmmakers. There is a great deal of work in updating contracts and research inquiries. Financing is all um, payments from bookings, royalties, bookkeeping <clears throat> and accounts. Design and engagement is mostly uh, social media and our website. And then planning is organizational and the material care and fundraising. We think it is incredibly important for the work of the film and video makers who Cine Nova distributes to stay together. The collection has become a very specific assemblage, which has changed over time and has been worked on by uh, different people. So all of the different people that have been involved in uh, Cine Nova over the years. I also want to uh, give a shout out to, um, and in the context, um, and of different, very different political, social political moments. For us, distribution has been a process of recontextualizing and, reflect, and reflecting on distribution from the angles of politics, desire and contingency, rather than sticking to performing a delegated authority on behalf of which the distribution contract implies. Thus, the films should traverse debates in this moment, be seen side by side with contemporary works, be they film, video, essays, or other media, and on platforms which were not necessarily envisaged, envisaged for the most part um, uh, during the time of the organization's existence and which we are now uh, reconfigured with. As uh, many of you know, um, Cine Nova was started in 1991, following the merger of two feminist film video distributors, uh, Circles and Cinema of Women, each formed in 1979. Uh, number three, uh, this, is, this says women only screenings and it's struck through. As part of its history and approach, Cine Nova distributed film and video works through th thematic programs that addressed oppositional histories, post and decolonial struggles, questions of reproductive labor and representations of gender and sexuality, import importantly drawing out the relations and alliances between these different struggles. When funding was removed in 2001, so did time to maintain this distribution tactic or take out on other works that reflected ongoing developments in these different areas. 
we began uh, a process with a shift of an adjective from women's film and video to feminist film and video, reflecting a collection of works made by directors who identify variously as women, transgender, gender non-conforming, and gender non-binary, and marking a wider shift in understandings of the subject within feminism. And four, I hope I'm doing okay for time. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, uh, and then five, um, uh, working practice. One of the more helpful qualities that we might take as a model influence or a protocol is the care needed in attending to an organization influenced by feminism, class-based analysis, race, disability, questions of social justice and media representation whilst conforming to the legal demands of running a limited company with charitable status in the United Kingdom. This movement between different ideas and practices is crucial to the work we do together. And in the process of doing it, we are building relational and communication skills with others. The work we do operates across volunteer run spaces, public art spaces, self-organized programming, educational context, social, community, public, and private. Whilst there are fewer independent cinemas um, and none that are open right now, mm -hmm. um, there has been increased programming of film and video in art contexts and museums online, as well as political spaces and research and practices in higher education. So we encourage dialogue around the screenings that we and others organize through making connections with existing groups in the places where work is shown or circulated and by inviting uh, others to frame, watch, curate and write about the different works in the City Nova collection. Uh, we make no claims towards a, a radical method we are doing the work that is necessary for the basic upkeep of the collection over a long period of time. And for most of this time with very few material resources. That's, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Um, it was very nice uh, listening to you while you were um, writing the, uh, reading these documents. It somehow makes us um, conscious that archiving film is not only about archiving film, but also archiving these practices has a lot to do with writing and uh, sharing this writing and writing collectively. Um, I appreciate that you already use words like uh, care and autonomy, <laughs> uh, keeping your archive uh, active uh, or your collection active. And um, I think that we can, we can go on and discuss a little bit uh, how you do that uh, currently um, after. But first, let's hear uh, Nicole. Uh, Nicole, I think that you, you plan on, on share a video. I don't know if you want to do it right now or um, the floor is uh, yours. At, at the end, please. Okay. If you don't mind. Okay. Hola, hello. Um, I would like first to thank the Mostra to, uh, for the invitation to, uh, to, this, uh, to this meeting, to this uh, conference. Uh, and to uh, thank also Emma, Carol, and Deborah to participate with me to this, uh, uh, to this conference. Um, I just want to, to, uh, to let you know that the, the actual uh, center, uh, the actual center team is not strict, strictly speaking an activist feminist collective, but we are all feminists and involved in, um, in cinema. And um, it's a team of, uh, the team is composed of three uh, permanent staff and two person for the website Genre Image, Gender Images, and uh, for the workshop uh, that we made in, uh, in schools and, um, and, um, and in, in schools and, uh, and colleges. Uh, the team uh, work in coordination with, uh, with a board composed of feminists, uh, only, we, only women, but we are not uh, close to, uh, to men, but it's uh, the story. And um, we are the heir of the founders, of which I want to tell you just a few words. Um, uh, 
uh, you know that in uh, 1982, Simone de Beauvoir agreed uh, to the, um, the request of the three founder. Uh, the three founder are Carol Rousseau-Poulos, you said that before. Carol Rousseau-Poulos was a feminist pioneer, video pioneer and a feminist uh, activist. Delphine Serig, actress, uh, direct, director, and a human rights and feminist activist too. And Johan Avider, a translator and a feminist activist and feminist director. So it's a three, uh, the three founder of the center. I had the chance to work with them at the beginning during two or three years. And after that, I made other things, but uh, I was at the beginning of the center uh, working as an uh, archivist. <coughs> uh, these three feminist uh, uh, activists founder, uh, were, were involved in a video practice and uh, they put at the heart of their objective the objective of the center, the conservation and the production of film concerning women history, rights, struggles, creation. And at the same time, they, they continue to practice uh, that on, their own work as directors. You have to know that uh, in, uh, in the 70s and 80s, there is no, for example, there is no theater with a video projector. It doesn't exist. Uh, so it was a little bit more complicated than nowadays to, to organize screenings and uh, and, uh, and debate uh, because we had to link uh, every every um, uh, recorder with TV and uh, and it was not so simple and there was a lot of failure during the screenings but uh, <laughs> the technical story was important and all these women were at the same time directors and technicians it's, I think it's important because um, always we see that uh, technicians are mainly men so it was not the case of the Simon de Beauvoir Center it's, it's not the case today. Uh, the center closed in 1993, uh, as you said, for financial reason. And uh, it reborn, it, the center uh, was reborn in uh, 2003 with a new team, except me, but I was in the, in the old uh, team at the beginning. And one of the center original aim was to draw up an inventory of all existing films concerning Delphine Serig and Simone de Beauvoir and to see uh, the distribution to see to the distribution of the founder's video. Um, in line with, uh, with the founder wishes, the center manage, maintains, restore, digitize audiovisual archives and present it to the public. I think that the presentation to the public, it's very, very important, not just to have all the videos, all the films in a, in a closet. Uh, the collection comprises uh, many films and videos by militant feminists, gay and lesbian of the 70s and 80s but also uh, recent work that include documentaries, video art, experimental films, uh, and some short fiction films produced both in France and abroad. So we have a, an international collection. Uh, the video and film concern work, equal salary between men, um, women and men, sexuality, art, sport, women, LGBTQI rights, sexism, feminist theories, etc. Uh, with acquisition of new works, the center continually expands its collection. Uh, this work helps to promote, helps promote little known, invisible or often forgotten film and video. As a result, for example, work by Carol Rousseau-Poulos, Delphine Seri, Johanna Vider, the three founders, but also video from collective as Lemus Samuse, I, could, I couldn't translate it in, 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 to English, uh, Videa, Les Insomuses, Defiant Muses, I think, and video out are available again and in circulation for screenings. Um, all these video collectives from the 70s uh, were able to use the new video technology. Now it's uh, easy to, uh, to film with, uh, uh, with our smartphone, for example, but it was uh, the case at this time. Today, our collection uh, counts uh, 1,300 titles. Uh, of which uh, 320 are in distribution. So it's uh, different. Uh, I just want to recall the, the center mission uh, today. Um, I think that we have seven missions or more. Uh, first of one is uh, restoration, restoration, preservation, digitization, difficult to say, and expansion of the audiovisual collection. Uh, to workshop with young people. Uh, we make some uh, film analysis uh, based on gender and uh, feminist gaze. Uh, three, the distribution of film and video through rental and sale. 
for organization of screenings and training workshop for prison inmates. And we, we make a, a screenings every month, uh, except during the lockdown. <laughs> um, every month screenings in a woman jail, in big woman jail in, uh, in near Paris. And, uh, but we work also with men and young people uh, in prison. Five seminars with artists and filmmakers. We have a seminar uh, tomorrow with uh, Vivian Ostrowski, an experimental filmmaker, for example. Seven event organization and programming. We made programming for other um, institutions. And seven on-demand research requests for film and footage because people uh, know that we are um, specialized in women issues. So they ask us to make some, uh, some, some research. Okay, I have many things to, to say, but um, I think that we, we have not many times. So uh, I think that uh, one, one um, important thing is to preserve, but also to enrich uh, our collection. And preserving means uh, fighting uh, against the ravages of times because video is really fragile and it's the main, um, the main part of, uh, of the collection is a uh, video. And we have to be aware of the technolo technological uh, advances. So we make uh, some, um, uh, we transfer all the do all documents in a new uh, technological system. And we have a, a very uh, important and a very good partner, the French National Library. Uh, I don't know if you, um, just to explain that in France, we have a legal deposit for films, for video and for TV. There is three institution uh, for that um, because uh, in France we like uh, complicated things. So we have three different institution and the institution for video is um, the French National Library. So we have this agreement since, uh, I don't know, uh, since 2005. Uh, so we can uh, put our archives in a safe condition here and to have uh, some digitalization or restoration of video. And um, now, in this mom at the moment, uh, Sois belle et tais-toi, Be Pretty and Shut Up, uh, the film uh, directed by Delphine Serig, is in, uh, in restoration um, at, the National French, at the French National Library. And we also uh, collaborate with a network of Cinémathèque in France. Um, it's, uh, they are Cinémathèque of amateur, I don't know if you say that, amateur and activist film. So we exchange uh, technical issues, but also uh, um, we have a database. It's a, it's a database uh, uh, made by uh, one of these institutions and we share also um, this database. Some words about the, about the workshop with young people. I think it's important because we want to, uh, to have a relation with young people and to uh, um, to screen not only film for a, a feminist audience, but also for, for a general audience and public. So we have decided to create um, a website. Uh, the website is uh, Genre Image in French, or so Gender Images. And it's like a big uh, box of tools and people can uh, watch uh, film uh, on this website, but also have uh, analysis of films. And uh, all these analyses are, are made with a feminist gaze or as we say, lunettes de genre, um, gender uh, glasses. Mm. Okay. <laughs> so we have many, many uh, workshops uh, with uh, young people um, in uh, schools, but also in universities and colleges. And also in prison, as I said before. Uh, other thing is to participate in contemporary creation. Um, the center value working with artists and has created six years ago, a collective traveling feminism. And this group uh, aimed to be the labor laboratory of the center's collection and know-how and seeks to attract and develop several types of research which constitute the current state of the art in the artistic treatment of the archives university research on situated knowledge and technical research. Uh, Travelling Feminism uh, proposed an experimentation on the feminist, queer and post-colonial use of the audiovisual archives. And the underlying idea was to promote the archive by making them available to artists who want to use them for inspiration 
or in new installation or in films. And this collective uh, has organized research workshop and seminar open to artists during uh, three years, uh, open to artists, researchers, militant academics, and people who love film uh, simply. And we can see that the exhibition uh, um, Delphine Serig and the Feminist Video Collective of the 70s and 80s um, was in part the result of, of all this work during uh, five or six years. And I would like to thank Natasha Petresin Bachelet and Giovanna Zaperi, the curator of this exhibition. This exhibition took place at uh, the Lam Museum in Ville of Dask in France, in the, in the north of France, and at the Reina uh, Sofia Museum in Madrid. I hope that uh, you saw it. <laughs> and uh, now we work also with uh, 10 European artistic institutions for a project, uh, an European project called Woman, uh, Womart. It seems a woman and art. So uh, in short, we follow in the footsteps of our founder using the camera, using films as tool of emancipation and international feminist struggles. Uh, we want to combine social, social criticism, humor, feminist solidarity and activism with a feminist gaze. Through our collection of militant video, contemporary documentary and experimental video, I think that the center play, plays a crucial role in preserving the legacy of women and queer cinema. And to conclude, uh, I will present a small clip presenting Avraka is very short, it's two minutes. In fact, it's an appeal for donation that we met uh, uh, two days ago, one day ago. So uh, just to, to uh, let you know that we accept all currencies if you want to donate to the center. Thank you. <laughs> That's very nice. That's very good to know. Um, let's play the video and uh, then we, we go on with the conversation. Okay. Elles sont soigneuses quand il ne faut pas être soigné. Elles sont débraillées quand il faudrait être très habillé. Keeping calm. Je ne suis rien officiellement, je suis que la femme de mon mari. Losing count, losing control. Elle est assez Shaking. belle, mais trop masculine. No time to make amends. C'est vrai qu'à pour baiser. Ça fait déjà 40 ans que euh, toutes les femmes baissent la tête. On va pas continuer comme ça, c'est pas possible. Ce qui libérera les femmes. C'est la totale élimination d'un système travail-argent. I come here to read my poetry tonight as a black, feminist, lesbian, poet. Je ne pense pas que ce qui concerne 51% de la population mondiale soit secondaire. Jusqu'à présent, je n'ai pas pleuré, je ne voulais pas pleurer. De toute façon, je vivrai sans peur, je ne veux pas avoir peur de ceci, avoir peur de cela. Mami, tengo a mi mamá por el otro lado. Thank you, Nicole. Um, it was it was very nice also that you introduced. Um, I think that M was uh, talking about uh, reflecting on distribution, and you also talked about reflecting on exhibition and how to um, how the the educational workshops can play a role also in 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 that. I have the feeling that we that today. I mean, all your projects are. Um, quite holistic in the way that they uh, make the archive live, no? Um, well, thanks for, for sharing your experience. I would, I would um, give the word to Carola. Well, thank you very much for organizing this wonderful event and uh, I'm very happy to be part of it. And thank you to the others for joining. Uh, when I thought about this meeting, I realized that I never really worked in a collective 
except around 1975, when I was a member of a cinema collective called Pupille Iris, where I learned how to operate the 35 millimeter projector and where indeed we collectively decided on the films we showed at the time, Soviet avant-garde and Monty Python. <laughs> Uh, the cinema is still existing today. It is still run by a collective of mainly students and the Kinothek Asta Nielsen is still mm. collaborating with them. However, looking at the work of Kinothek Asta Nielsen past and present, I can say that networking and cooperation is the key to our work. And we have always tried to pr provide opportunities where the interests of various people who work in different areas and also from different feminist perspective could come together. Um, in the following text, I will use um, two pages I have written for this uh, occasion and in which I'm talking about my personal work and the work of the Kinotik Asta Nielsen. And um, I had called it the Kinotek Asta Nielsen 20 glorious years. <laughs> uh, as I said, for 20 years, I was the curator of the Kinotek, which I initiated in a, at the time, favorable uh, political uh, situation locally. And it then was uh, funded officially at the end of 1999 in Frankfurt am Main. And from the very beginning in collaboration with other people and always together with uh, my companion, Heide Schlüppmann. The Kinothek Asta Nielsen was named for the great Danish actress of the silent era, who we consider to be very important in the history of cinema and for the possibilities that it offered to women and to the cinema of women. Until late 2019, I was responsible, I was mainly responsible for programming and related events and for the organization. The first big event we held in Frankfurt in the year 2000 was called Frau Kino, Woman Cinema. In it, we looked at work by women directors from the beginning to the present, to 2000. And we produced a, a publication along with it, with, which was a special edition of the magazine Frauen und Film. It's uh, this one here. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> we have many copies left, so we are happy to uh, distribute them. Please. <laughs> so uh, in 2018, Gabi Babic, who up till then had been the director of the Go East Festival in Wiesbaden, joined me. And since um, early 2020, she has been the curator and managing director of the Kinothek, and I hope she will be for the next 20 years. Gabi, I hope you're listening. In 2018, we also started a film festival, as you have mentioned before, which is called Remake Frankfurt Women's Film Days. Uh, the concept was developed by Gabi, Heide, and myself. And the idea is to always dedicate uh, each edition to a certain theme or complex. And the first was called Speaking Up, and it was 100 years of women's right to vote in 50 years of feminist filmmaking. And the second uh, edition was called Views of History. Um, it took place in 2019 and from now on, and you're all invited, it will be he held biennially. I'm still one of the curators of the festival and I'm also responsible for our archive. Uh, and the uh, importance of archival work has been mentioned here already. The archive is largely a collection of documents of 50 years of feminist film work beginning with the 1970s. To understand the context in which feminist filmmaking and the new women's movement evolved in the 1970s, it is important to look at what was done in the field of criticism and festivals. 
a lot of materials exists. We have a substantial collection that comes from various sources. It was originally based on my personal collection, which I'm very happy to make available to the public. My collection began when I attended one of the first feminist film festivals ever in Copenhagen in 1974, which was collectively organized by the Red Stockings um, Collective. From that point on, I kept all the printed materials I could find. And meanwhile, our archive has grown through the liquidation of many a private library. And uh, in 1978, I got involved with the Frauen in Film Collective in Berlin. And I was one of the co-editors when it moved to Frankfurt in the early 1980s. Starting in the mid 80s, I began focusing on programming. Frauen und Film remains a reference point to our work up to this day. The Kinotheque's first priority is to keep women's film work from being forgotten. As we wrote in our founding statement, I quote, the Kinotheque Asta Nielsen aims to make film history by way of film programs. In doing so, it will take up some of the loose threads left by the theoretical and practical film work of the more recent women's movement, the intention being to pull that work back from oblivion. A lot of work has been done in that direction, so this was 20 years ago, and if we look at what, you know, the situation is today, it has improved um, so much to all the work that has been done. Keeping women's film work from entirety of film history alive in the present day requires, first of all, that copies be secured. Quite a lot has happened in the archive since 2000. The Kinotheque has con contributed to this through its research and program work. But a second aspect of preservation is equally important, bringing the films to the audience, that is, into the cinema. Films are only present when they are seen. A third issue poses particular difficulties today. We support the various materialities of film history. After all, one's perception of a film is determined not least by the material and format in which it was produced. We could have um, a lot to discuss about what it means that, you know, um, due to the present situation, um, most of the work has to be shown online and uh, what the effects of this are. <clears throat> Film is a collective product that is in itself political. Making people aware of this and working against a film history of masterworks and the male dominated canon was a basic approach of feminist film criticism. Women directors have also worked in the format of the auteur film so when we look more closely at film history, we see that notable women directors were only able to realize their films in a network as Germaine Dulac made her films in a lesbian and queer context, for example. The collective strengthens the individuals who take a stand against the dominant structures. This is also reflected in the film's aesthetics, closed forms are broken open, features and documentaries blend. Players before and behind the camera bring differently experienced realities to the film. This also makes them potentially more open for a diverse audience. Close collaboration with Heide Schlüppmann and the inclusion of and cooperation with various colleagues over 20 years of projects made it possible to not only maintain the Kinotheque, but to develop it further. Yet the Kinotheque Asta Nielsen is not a collective in the strict sense of the word. The project arose from a shortage that I was not alone in perceiving and for which I sought a solution with others. The first talks I had with Ulrike Zimmermann at the end of 89, I remember about the necessity of a feminist archive, living archive and material archive. Um, 
there was a lack of recognition of women's film work and a corresponding neglect of it in archives and by distributors and cinemas. From the beginning, the Kinotheque's operation was based on exchange with others. For me, program and archive work always go hand in hand with communication initiatives and ideas about collaboration and mutual support. The majority of the work was done by me and others on a practical a voluntary basis for many years. Personal commitment was therefore always required. But running a project in a group from the beginning is something else again, even though this would certainly have been possible with the Kinotheque. For many reasons, the idea was not actualized in practice. It would have meant taking responsibility for the Kinotheque in a collective. Many women's collectives, including and especially film-related ones, were founded in the 60s and 70s yet not too many lasted, but they did. Also, uh, as we have heard, for example, in the uh, contribution about the Leeds Animation Workshop and how the importance of this collective idea uh, is um, um, getting more important uh, again. In the late 90s, this kind of establishment, and this is also said in this um, um, text, was no longer reproducible. And today, many film festivals are dependent on a great many voluntary workers. But as far as I can see, uh, these collectives are rather temporary and fleeting. Lasting collectives base their work not only on an idea, on social and political commitment, but also on economic viability, however slight and in need of improvement. The Kinotheque has fought for this through years of effort. What remains constant is that the substantive work of autonomous organizations suffers from an increasing number of application and billing transactions from power politics, networking, and not least from the investment in publicity, in other words, in self-promotion. The Kinotheque Asta Nielsen is currently supported by the city of Frankfurt and a novelty this year institutionally by the state of Hesse, it's been a long way. This lends it a certain amount of planning security and especially allows for work to be paid. It is becoming even more important and even more complicated to preserve the contextual and political independence of our cinema work, to refuse to engage in competition and to adapt to financial pressures. Finally, we call ourselves a kinotic because we support not only films by women, but also the cinema as an institution. Since the beginning, and especially in the early silent film years, cinemas were special places for women. The screening of silent films with live music is one of our areas of focus, not least to bring this place to the present. Through our collaboration with archives and distributors is enormously important. Our comrades are the cinemas. Cinemas still operated by collectives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carola. Um, you said 20 glorious years? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <Thanks>. it was a bit. <laughs> Thanks for sharing a, a piece of... I, a bit this of is those. what I felt. <laughs> Um, I really like when you say that you're doing um, film history by doing film programs. Um, uh, that's uh, quite connected to what we are trying to do with this, uh, this kind of programs um, too. And uh, I think that maybe later, if we have time, you can tell us a little bit how you imagined Remake Festival and why is it uh, planned as a, um, a festival that has in the center also the question of the archive and uh, the feminist film history. Um, but again, first we move to Debbie. Ah, well, I feel very, um, <laughs> I feel very honored to be here with um, old friends and new friends. Um, I feel like we've all been working 
together in some way for so many years. Um, and I really just want to acknowledge and appreciate all of those years of work of Drac Magic, uh, doing a wonderful festival, Simone de Beauvoir for all the work that they do. Corolla, who was there in 1984, uh, at 1974 <laughs> um, at this film festival. And of course, I know well both uh, Cinema of Women and uh, Circles before they became Cinenova and of course Cinenova. I think we represent an amazing history. Mm -hmm. And since so many of you spoke about pr preservation and history, I just want to say that I think there's a tremendous amount of work that we all need to do. And I'm so glad to hear, Carola, that you've kept all of these materials and that you're working on that archive because unfortunately so much of it has been lost. Um, including, I will say at Women Make Movies, where I had kept every festival catalog from any women's film festival, anything, and it got destroyed in a flood. Um, and that, that history is so hard to find now. So I just, yeah, I just had to say that. Um, wow. Uh, I've been leading Women Make Movies since 1983, which feels like it, an actual, like it is a quarter, more than, oh, it's almost half a century, which is crazy. It's just crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, but the organization actually started before me. It started in 1972, and it was founded by Ariel Dougherty and Sheila McLaughlin, and a woman named Dolores Bagarian, who somehow has been kind of lost, another kind of vestige of, of history lost. I think that's going to be the theme of, of what I'm talking about today. Um, she resurfaced in a thesis that was made on Women Make Movies, and um, we've just recently updated our own website. Uh, however, the organization was started as a teaching organization to teach women to put uh, cameras into the hands of women who didn't have the experience to make films. Uh, we started in a church basement. Um, there was a sign that was put up on a, a, on a bodega, a, a grocery store in the neighborhood. Uh, and I still have that, that flyer actually that said, come women, muchachas, housewives, secretaries, uh, come make a movie, come on Wednesday night to this church basement and we'll teach you to make a movie. Um, the organization spent about 10 years making films and it's really that where our collective practice uh, I think was the most important because those 40 or so short films and I don't know how many videos were made in a collective fashion. Um, though, again, in doing some research, I found that, that each of the films, the films were not, the subject of the films was not a collective decision. The making of the films was collective, but the films were actually the vision of, of one person, which I think is another kind of theme that goes through the history of women make movies. We've always been, uh, we've functioned in, in many collective ways, but when I came to the organization, when it was about to fall apart in the 19, uh, early 1980s, and I'll also comment that I think it's so interesting that Simone de Beauvoir uh, closed after 10 years. Um, uh, Sinanova and Cow went through major changes, or Circles and Cow went through major changes similarly, and Women Make Movies almost fell apart uh, after 10 years. Um, and when I came back to the organization after being an intern in the 70s, um, it was agreed that I would in fact be the director and we changed to a hierarchical structure. One which I have to say that I, I think is part of the reason why we've been able to continue doing what, we, what we've been doing <laughs> for uh, almost 50 years now. Um, however, there are many vestiges of our, of our commitment to collectivity. We still make decisions about acquisitions in our distribution program uh, collectively. Uh, we also make decisions about what films we're going to accept into our production assistance program. Um, but I think that the focus of Women Make Movies has been very different to the other organizations and how they've been presented. Um, you know, going back to that history, in the early 70s, there were almost 70 organizations in the United States that were focused on women's film. Uh, there was a conference of women's film organizations around that time and almost every single one of those organizations except women make movies has has disappeared um 
the ones which have remained, and I mean worldwide, not just in the US, are the ones that are focused on distribution and on preservation and on in some way working on making sure that work gets from filmmakers to the audiences that need to see them. And it's that connection to audience and that commitment to audiences, as well as the commitment to filmmakers that has really been at the heart of uh, Women Make Movies practice. Um, we actually don't put one above the other. Our audiences and the people that use our films in our distribution program are as important as the filmmakers whose work we distribute. Um, and I think partially because of that, we've always had a very deep commitment to making sure that those women whose voices were most misrepresented and underrepresented in the mainstream media were a focus of women make movies work. Women of color, women with disabilities, older women, women of, of various genders, LGBTQI, you know, this has always been also at the heart of what we do and, and continues to be. We're really thrilled about what's happened in the last year in the US in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement and the way that, that black led or organizations and black leaders have made this a, a political statement, one which we deeply support. But we're also very proud that this is something that we've been doing for more than, uh, more than 35 years. Um, in fact, I'm very pleased that I think that Women Make Movies had an impact on circles in terms of those um, those uh, groups of collections that they that they put out um, that really did focus on racism. Um, I also want to say that that this work is not easy. It's really really hard, and I honor all of you for doing it as long as you've done it. Um, and I honor all of the people who have worked with Women Make Movies, and there are hundreds, our board, our staff, our interns, which number into the, into the way into the hundreds, um, have worked so hard because we've been defunded, as many of you have. We've been refunded. And one of the reasons why we focused on distribution is because it was the only way that the organization actually earned money. And that has been another theme for the organization is our commitment to being self-sustaining and not being um, not being dependent on government funders who decide that feminism is no longer important as they have, or that we are a feminist pornographer as we were claimed uh, during the 1980s and 90s and the, the, the censorship debates in, in the US. Um, so that, that's also really important. Um, I realize that I haven't really talked too much about what it is that we actually do. Uh, and just to kind of bring you up to date a bit, um, uh, we do distribute almost or more than 700 films by and about women from all over the world. We're very proud that about 40% of them are from women uh, and filmmakers from outside the US because we see that as part of our mission to really educate audiences about the real lives of women outside of the United States, which they don't get to see. Um, we just we work with everybody from universities, colleges, prisons, hospitals, community centers, girls groups, uh, uh, the government, the military, really anybody who we think needs to or wants to see films that have a feminist perspective. And it's that kind of infiltration work that as we call it, where we get our films to the military, to medical schools, to places that, that don't generally see these perspectives that in some ways we're most proud of. Um, we also work with streamers as they're called, with Netflix and Amazon and cable channels, HBO. Uh, I'm really thrilled that Illusions by du Julie Dash, a film from the 1980s, early 80s, was we just sold it to Turner Classics and it's gonna be on uh, cable television in, in two weeks. And that really speaks to uh, what so many of you have spoken about in terms of the importance of our archives and the importance of the work that we've been working with for so many years, which happily is getting a kind of um, renaissance uh, these days. Our production assistance program um, has grown since 1986 when we started working with Julie Dash on her uh, film Daughters of the Dust, helping her to raise money on that film. Uh, it now has almost 300 films that were filmmakers that were supporting in the program. Uh, they are films which 
premiere at the, at the world's largest film festivals. We're very proud that films from distribution and production assistants have won or been nominated for Academy Awards for 13 of the last, actually every year for the last 13 years. Um, and just recently, Dee Reese, a filmmaker who came out of our production assistance program with a film called Pariah, and went on to make a film in Hollywood called Mudbound, was the first black woman nominated for a best uh, adapted screenplay. She hired a woman cinematographer named Rachel Morrison, who was the first woman cinematographer to be nominated for an Academy Award. And it was that year that Yancey Ford was nominated uh, for a documentary, Strong Island, being the first transgender filmmaker to uh, have been nominated as such. And this is really, I think, our legacy. It's really working with filmmakers in the beginning of their careers, following through their careers, uh, and helping to actually have an impact on that mainstream media that, that I mentioned. Um, right now, we're working with a film which I think is, is very much uh, indicative of the work that we do. It's a film called Coded Bias. It's a film about facial recognition software and its implicit bias against people of color. Um, it was a film that we worked with in our production assistance program, providing support and guidance and, and uh, sponsoring grants. And it's a film that we distribute. Um, it's now screening in virtual cinemas around the United States and actually some around the world. It's a total digital release, which has to do with the future. Um, I, for one, am deeply enamored of and committed to physical, physical media. And I'm very glad that I started out being a 16 millimeter projectionist, not 35 Corolla, but 16. Uh, and I've worked my way through every single video format since the beginning of video. Um, and now I'm shepherding women make movies through the digital, the digital era, which is really exciting because the access is extraordinary. Um, as Mart had mentioned, we did a virtual film festival and we were able to reach 10,000 people without very much marketing at all in over a hundred countries, including Antarctica. And that's extraordinary. And that is indeed the future. Um, the reason why Coded Bias, why I mentioned that film is because it's a film that is not about a particularly women's quote unquote women's issue. However, it's a film that was made by a woman of color. Almost all of the scientists in the film are women, women and mostly women of color. Um, it's a film that really represents, I think, what the future of, uh, of feminist filmmaking should be. It's about films where women are listened to, where women are seen as experts, where women are defining the question and providing the answer. Um, and that's, I think, where I will, where I will end. Um, maybe just to say that, that preservation is so important because history defines us in so many ways, but we can always change the future. And I think that we want to make sure that we're also developing talent behind us that will see that future. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you very much. Um, it has been wonderful listening to you. Um, I think that we have still some minutes to, to open the, the debate and discussion, or um, I don't know if we have any questions, but uh, I do have. Uh, we have already. Well, you can start. Maybe. I, I, let me just start uh, with um, uh, talk, talking or asking you a little bit about the 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 archive or the, uh, I mean, all, all of you, as, as you already said, you're doing somehow this preservation work uh, in many different ways, like th through digitization, um, distribution, education, um, programming, no? And even though M was saying that uh, they don't call themselves uh, radical or what they do, they don't want to use this, this word, I think it's quite uh, disruptive and, and I think it's, very archiving is very political, no? And uh, and of course, the stories that we are preserving will be the stories that uh, people will remember. And we need those references um, far from the male-centered film history that all we already know. No, we need those ref references for 
for the future, as Debbie was, was saying, for the present and for the, and for the future. And um, maybe it's a general question, but I would uh, like to ask you, what would you say that are the main challenges in your archiving work? Uh, is, is that a financial challenge? Uh, maybe that, I don't know if you want to go straight to talk about financial, but, um, but it might be a problem for us. It is, for instance. Uh, also, we're not living. I mean, the Mediterranean countries maybe don't have the the history of preserving that the Anglo-Saxon and 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 French uh, do have. But um, yeah, that would would be one question. And uh, how do, how do you from the, from the very uh, basic question, how do you choose what to digitize first? From the uh, question of financing, or how do you how do you organize proper contexts for um, exhibiting this work, uh, this work and sharing it after not only archiving it, but uh, disseminating also the, the, the films? I don't, I don't know if somebody wants to start. I, I will start because I want to throw out another question or another, another issue that's connected to this that you made me think about, Marta. Um, of course, this is a huge, huge, huge issue for us. Um, and we had to make a very, very big decision a number of years ago about what we were going to do with all of our 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter prints because we could no longer house them where we were housing them. We had to move our own offices and we had to decide, are we going to put it with the university that uh, was primarily uh, the universities that were interested were all women's universities with women's archives, or were we going to place it with a film uh, archive? And for me, that was a huge decision. And it's one that I would love to, to talk about because what we did decide to do is to give our, our all of our prints to the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences because we felt that it was really important that these films are part of film history, not just women's history though we knew that the women's organizations would absolutely value the work much more than the academy would, would value it. Um, we now are faced with a similar decision in terms of our, our video, which the academy was not so interested in. Um, and yes, making the decisions about what we're going to digitize, because we still have about a fourth of the collection that hasn't been digitized. Um, and finding the money for that is, is very difficult. And that's on top of digitization is the first step. Preservation is the next. Um, and finding that funding for preservation is extraordinarily difficult. Um, so I just throw that out with, as a comment and also a concern. Thanks. Nicole, I saw you raise your hand. <laughs> Uh, yes, I just want to say that uh, the financial part is uh, really important, so it's an issue, I think, for everybody. Uh, we have the chance in France to have some uh, help from the states and from uh, cities and from uh, um, private foundation, uh, so uh, it helps a lot. But uh, also we can uh, sell um, films and also extract our films for new films, and uh, for us it's a, a good way of... Uh, of finance, all the, all the mission of the center. And regarding the choice of, um, of films to digitize, I think that we choose uh, the, the video because we, we have mainly videos in the center. So we choose uh, the videos in a very uh, bad physical t um, state, you know? Mm -hmm. And so digitize first this one because sometimes we have a, a very good sound, but no image. But we choose to keep the sound because the sound is important, as you said, in the 70s, especially um, people talk a lot and there is no um, editing like with many cuts. So uh, I think that we, when we have the sound, it's important to, uh, to keep it and no image, it's not important. And uh, we have also, the, we are lucky in France because we have this collaboration with the French National Library. So um, to answer to Debra, we put all the original um, tape, um, uh, in, uh, in the French National Library uh, to preserve, but we, are, um, we have a, a, an agreement because we are the owner of the tapes. Uh, we don't give the tapes to, uh, to, to the library, yeah. mm -hmm. but they preserve it. Hmm. Carola, yes. 
I have a question, uh, Debbie. When uh, you have your friends with the Academy Archive, mm -hmm. whom last year we have been able to borrow Illusions, the 16 mm -hmm. year print, who uh, has the final control if a print goes out or not? Can you decide on who um, can, uh, yeah. can borrow a print? Yeah, the decision actually is it's really made based on the on the equipment that the group has because these are all really valuable prints and we can't just have them go out. So I can't remember the word that's in our agreement with the Academy that as long as it's a, a, a responsible uh, look, I really don't remember the words, but basically the idea is that if it's a film festival, if it's a museum, if it's a cinematheque, if it's a film society, if it's a serious, place where the film is going to be shown then then they will send it and we can ask them to send to send prints wherever we want to ask them to send it but we just want to be respectful of that um and i will just say that illusions for example is a print that we were able to work with ucla film archives on restoring it and that is a, a complete and that's really from an archive perspective it's really fascinating or from a preservation perspective because something was done um that is not normally done, which is that when Julie Dash made that film, she there was a mistake made with the with the sound. And for years, we were getting complaints from people about the sound. And when it was uh, restored, they they did correct the sound. Um, so it's wonderful that there's a new a new uh, wonderfully preserved copy, but it's not really a preservation copy because it's not the original film. Mm. Just curious. Mm -hmm. Em, would you like to, to add something to the discussion from your perspective and experience? Um, yeah, I mean, I can say that, um, I mean, with Cine Nova's film prints, uh, we have most of them are at the British Film Institute where we, they're stored and then when we want when there are bookings for those prints, we pay a small fee, well, actually not that small fee, but to have them processed or to be sent out um, by the British Film Institute. And some of our prints are at the Lux building where we have our um, little office or little desk space. So um, in terms of those print, the 16 millimeter prints, um, and that was, the kind of legacy of that decision um, was a very problematic <laughs> one um, because of the merger between um, the sort of merger between circles and cinema of women. And then um, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the name of the dis film distributor that we, that the film prints were with. Yeah, exactly. And they went bankrupt. And then a lot of those prints in that transition period uh, went missing, were destroyed. Um, and so we, I mean, in the early 2000s, spent quite a bit of time just going, uh, trying to plead with any staff member at the BFI to look out for anything that had a cinema of women label on it in their collection because we felt that there were things that you know were missing that but may have ended up in the bfi collection and that was um you know felicity sparrow and myself sometimes um just trying to uh yeah on a one-to-one -one basis ask uh, people working there to look out for anything with the cinema of women in particular um, label because that were that those films in particular were lost. So um, so yeah. So in terms of like you know any prevention or of that kind of uh, destruction <laughs> of the material, um, you know it's still very hard to do that entirely because the materials are not in our possession as such or not in our building. Um, but we, you know, we trust that the VFI is taking care of everything. Mm 
um, even though <laughs> you know, we have this history. So um, yeah, so I think the, the issue then about what we focus on in terms of preservation also comes um, just, I mean, in terms of our capacity, but also filmmakers who are um, in touch with us and like more recently, um, you know, we've been trying to focus on Haney Schrauer's work and Leila and the Wolves and um, the Hour of Liberation, which she has um, digitized and been showing recently. But um, yeah, the film Leila and the Wolves um, is in disrepair. Um, so, uh, and that's, you know, a huge, just a personal endeavor for Haney. And we try to um, support her with that um, and try and make connections with preservation funds. And um, that's just one example. Um, so, yeah, and I think the, the, you know, the focus has been on the most uh, fragile materials, um, as Nic uh, Nicole also mentioned, so. Mm. Yeah, I, I, something else. I just yeah. wanted to say, I think it's so important that, you know, it's, it, this panel, the concept is about collectivity. And I really think that it's so important that we all work more collectively with each other. Mm. You know, what's happening right now is that a lot of this work is now starting to be valued and the control is being lost by feminist organizations, which in one way it's going into the mainstream, which is very good. On the other hand, it's, it's we're losing it and we're, lo we're losing the ability to put it in to a certain context, which is really important. You know, when I came to Women Make Movies in the early 80s, four women's film distributors, Cinemain in Amsterdam, Cinema of Women in London, and Women in Focus in Vancouver, and Women Make Movies came together to, to, to jointly create materials for, a, actually it was a video called uh, Trial for Rape, Proceso por Stupro, and a very important early Italian film. Um, you know, we need to be looking at our collections and seeing what do you, what is in the Sinanova collection that is in the Women Make Movies collection. What materials do you have, Carola, that we don't have anymore? What can we add to what you're doing? You know, all these women film festivals. I used to go to, Nicole used to work with, um, with the film festival in Crete, and I used to go into the room where it was all the films that were being submitted to the festival, and I would look through all of them. So I and I wonder what happened to all of those tapes. Women Make Movies has saved boxes and boxes of all of the videotapes that were submitted to us for acquisition. My staff didn't want us to. We're paying for them to be stored. They're not even being stored in the proper location. Um, and yeah, so it's a, it's a plea to all of us to figure out some way um, that we can really be working together more. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, oh, I also just wanted to say that, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, and I also, you know, in terms of like advocacy work for films in general, um, you know, for uh, history projects or educational projects or um, restoration projects to, you know, stop reproducing um, the, you know, restoration of filmmakers that already have so much <laughs> attention. Yes. So, yes. yeah, so I think, you know, what, you know, that that is, you know, in addition to our work is, um, you know, a, pl a plea to, <laughs> to that, uh, that practice to stop. <laughs> so. I think Nicole wanted to add something and then Carola, and then if, if, if that's okay with you, we will um, at least uh, uh, answer one question of our audience, virtual audience. Yes, no, I just wanted to add that uh, it's important to understand the um, technical issues of preservation and uh, restoration. And I think that it's important that young uh, people, women, feminists or men, it doesn't matter, uh, understand uh, all this issue because uh, if you have only um, regular men technician, I think it's a bad idea. You, if feminists have to be, yeah. feminists and LGBT yeah. people have to be involved in, uh, in preservation of uh, feminist and, LG and queer uh, films. Yeah. 
I just wanted to, to add that um, part of our festival concept is to preserve, uh, restore, raise the money for digitization and restoration of uh, work by women, um, which isn't um, in good shape anymore. So uh, the year before last, we restored all the work of a German filmmaker, Recha Jungmann. And uh, this, for the last festival, Debbie, you'll be delighted to hear that maybe. We did a splendid, I have to say, because we had the most wonderful technicians um, and restorers. We made um, um, a digitization for the cinema of Flaming Ears. Oh, really? Fantastic. Absolutely. Fantastic. Absolutely. Fantastic. Oh, my goodness. Um, I want to release I want to re-release that film. That's oh, we want, we want to re-release it all around the world. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. Great. So we made this effort and we raised the money for the two years. In the head. Wonderful. We can, we can continue. That's wonderful. I have to add that for this uh, program, the CCCB, the Center of Contemporary Culture in Barcelona, uh, digitized uh, the short film Give Us a Smile by Leeds Animation Workshop. Uh -huh. And that's the copy that it's <laughs> online right now. So, of course, mm -hmm. we're doing this work, but uh, slowly. Huh? And everyone is, is, is talking about um, the poor material conditions and um, we, we are a little bit in a hurry. So uh, yeah, I'm all for working together and, and finding the uh, means uh, to do so. Maria. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will try like to put together some of the questions we have received. Um, some of them has to do with the current situation, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic and the lockdown. And, um, uh, the audience asks, has the way of creating change during the pandemic? And also, is there a feminist way of understanding the pandemic? And maybe it's feminist advising for a more social and egalitarian future? Not an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> I will just say something that doesn't have to do with film, but I thought it was really fascinating. And it was a story that was on NPR this morning uh, or yesterday morning about the fact that men, it was this morning, that men are starting to have relationships with each other as friends that are more like women's relationships because they don't have sports as the focus of those relationships. And I was, and they're going for walks together. <laughs> Um, which they never ever did before. So I think that's an actually really interesting uh, feminist, um, uh, not response, but a, an impact, a feminist impact uh, of the pandemic. Um, it's a little bit of a joke, but it's true. <laughs> Um, I'll just, um, I mean, I could say in terms of the, how the pandemic has, you know, affected our work, um, or just, uh, I mean, I think some of the things I was trying to um, bring forward from our discussions in our working group and um, uh, the working kind of practices of an organization and working conditions. So, um, yeah, and I think in terms of how um, our our group and how many of the film video makers we work with and organizations that we um, uh, commit you know to in terms of contracts um, the question around disability and access and issues of um, re, you know re understanding or rethinking uh, the the uh, access to materials that we're distributing online um, and trying to address, um, I mean, within our working group issues around the uh, precarity of each of our circumstances. So I would just say on a, you know, on a level of just trying to locate how it's directly affecting um, members of our working group um, in terms of um, people with chronic illnesses or disabilities um, and how you know how that is something we've you know tried to kind of reflect 
and talk about with organizations that we're working with in terms of screening materials um, and thinking in, you know, in, in terms of access in, in general, in terms of uh, the materials that are online. So, hmm. um, Nicole, you wanted to say something. Uh, during uh, we uh, we made a special program during the first lockdown in uh, in France. Uh, the, the title was uh, "Restons uh, confinés mais restons féministes." Uh, I could I stay? Uh, it means stay at home, but uh, stay, at home. stay at home, but uh, being feminist at the same mm -hmm. time. And so we work with a VOD platform, uh, two VOD platform in France. And we, we put this program online. It was the first time that we have a program, not film, because we have films online with two platforms, but really a program, a feminist program online. And it was a, a huge success. Yeah, I think the access question is really fantastic. Mm. You know, we are now getting requests from groups that I don't think would actually be ordering the films from us if it wasn't that we now have um, a way of hosting a screening for them on our website. It's really easy. It's a lot more work for us, as I think somebody was mentioning before the, the panel started, just in terms of even how you had to organize this panel, hmm. it is more work. And actually, I will say the real downside, the huge downside is that we have lost a tremendous amount of income because universities and colleges budgets have been slashed. They don't have money. They are not able to buy it films that are for collections purposes. They can only buy films or licensed films, which they need to use in the classroom right now. And oftentimes the kinds of films that are based in the humanities, more creative work, uh, even just <laughs> women's studies films are considered humanities. They're not considered like the way that science films are that need to be used to teach virtually. They're looking for pedagogical use for, for teaching virtually. Um, and that's made things very hard for us. But I'm also truly excited because, because of the access issues um, and all of the different people that we're coming in touch with. Frankly, right now we're working with, I don't know how many corporations to get them and they're screening this film on facial, on facial recognition software and artificial intelligence made by women, with women experts. And that to me is, is fantastic. Um, again, it might have happened, but I don't know. I really don't. Hmm. Yeah, Carola. But I think we should, you know, in this whole debate, we should really, really keep in mind the enormous difference yeah. between um, watching films online, I have to say I'm sick and tired of it mm -hmm. by now, and, uh, but that's only my personal thing, but politically uh, it's a big issue and it's a big problem. And in a way, by showing these films online, you take away the, the whole experience of uh, a common, you take away the common experience and um, move into this market argument. I find it very complicated and very difficult and it needs a lot of debate, I think. Well, I just want to, I just want to respond to that for <laughs> one minute. Of course, of course, I completely understand what you're saying. But the other thing that's happened with these virtual screenings is that there are many, many, many more Q and A's with questions and answers with filmmakers, with filmmakers presenting their films, filmmakers being able to be all over the world within one week, as opposed to only being able to go places that could afford to bring them. You know, filmmakers being able to go to film festivals virtually, of course, you miss that one on one contact, but you also have access to industry people that you would not have because particularly filmmakers from the global south who couldn't possibly go to any of these events in Europe. Um, and I'm talking about in response to the question of creating, you know, have these changed, have things changed in terms of creation. Um, but 
of course, I'm deeply committed to the idea of group discussions and kind of that that shared experience. And, and I love seeing films in a theater and I don't ever want to stop that happening, you know? Yeah, somehow it feels that it's a two-faced um, mm. situation. And uh, of course, w what we have been missing a lot is the uh, com community reception. Yeah context mm. no you you need to keep it physical also to maintain what we are doing as a feminist film festival no and um when you lose the context and you go vi uh, virtual i mean you have plenty of good things as you were already you already mentioned mm. like accessibility we we were able to share our films with people that are not living in uh, barcelona n n nor catalonia i mean from the rest of spain which is wonderful at the same time we're uh, missing terribly and it's not nostalgia it's political also we're missing the the audiences the people the, com mm. the community a lot and um i hope this uh won't last much <laughs> that's what i can say um yeah nicole please yes and i want to add that for example uh, people in prison they don't have access in france they don't have access to internet so it's not possible everything is uh, just cancelled they don't have any uh, screenings, any debates, anything. So we have to think about that also. And I agree with Carola because I'm the the debate and the Q and A, uh, the real debate are really important, and especially with young people, because I think that many uh, professionals go online to have debates, but not the young people that uh, we uh, when we go to school and when we go to colleges. So all these things are, are just cancelled now. So it's a big problem, a huge problem. Yeah, uh, these these meetings are uh, safe spaces somehow. So um, we need to keep it physical at least uh, simultaneously with virtual, I think. Mm. Um, I'm so sorry, but uh, I think the time is up. It, it felt so short, I have to say. Um, uh, and I, I hope that this is only one of the first meetings that we might be doing around archiving and preserving and sharing our yeah. our works and uh, maybe um, I don't know uh, developing something together too. Uh, I really want to thank you for your time and your knowledge and all the work you've been doing all these wonderful mm -hmm. years, glorious years, and let's hope <laughs> that we can keep on doing that um, easily if mm -hmm. possible. Thank you, thank you very much. Moltes gràcies també a tota la gent que ho ha estat connectada darrere la pantalla en aquesta situació tan estranya i tan uh, uh, contemporània de, de la virtualitat que ara mateix estàvem, estàvem parlant. Uh, moltíssimes gràcies. Recordeu que les pel·lícules dels manifestos fílmics feministes continuen a filmin i us convidem a que, a que pugueu fer una ullada per acabar de contextualitzar també quin és el, el punt de vista um, de la programació eh, que tant, que tant que també s'ha explicat en aquesta, amb aquestes col·laboracions magnífiques. Ens veiem molt aviat i moltes gràcies. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Next time in Catalan. Yeah. Next time in Catalan.